And yeah, you're a fan of guitars, I can tell. Oh yeah, yeah, well, I'm a fan of cheap guitars because I have daughters in college and late stage high school, so... Uh, oh, well, that sounds familiar, uh, but with much younger children, straight out of nappies, but, um, but certainly they're expensive already. Oh my God. Um, I, I had a guitar once I bought for my friend for a hundred pounds with the amp, that's how cheap and rubbish it was. And the thing is, the yeah. thing it would probably sound pretty darn good if you get the right setup. The reality okay. is with guitars that, you know, it's a value break point thing where yes. if you spend a certain amount, you're going to get good enough. And then after that, it's all accoutrement, you know, like. Yeah, the for, nuances, you don't like, it's like great wine, you know, people are like, oh, that must be good because it was 500 quid. Well, you don't know really till you really know. Uh, I totally get it. I know what you mean. And I, yeah, it was, it was nice. One of those where I taught myself to play. But what that really was, was an indulgence in the tunes I liked at the time. So it was really nice to be able to play along things, but it was pretty awful. It was one of those things where it's like fun to do, but probably not to listen to. Well, you know, I'll be honest with you. The only lesson I took was when I was about in fifth, maybe not even fifth grade, one of wow. those one of those community after school type things where they learn, teach you how to tune a guitar and that's all I learned. And yes. since then I, I'm self-taught and which, which means I've got a massive hole in my technique, but <laughs> I still love it. You know, it's, it's an advocate. Oh, awesome. and, well, I'm one of those guys who like when I get excited about something, I dive into it. Mm. One billion percent. Yeah. And it's funny. I'm, I'm looking at a number of your presences online, you know, like the Richard Yeah. In Facebook, Instagram. Dude, you're everywhere all the time. And that's one of the things I love about you because you aren't just everywhere all the time. You're everywhere all the time with value. And I, I want to talk to you about that. But first, I want to give everybody a chance to get to know you. If you haven't met Richard Moore, who's kind of a redhead from Colchester, or do you? Colchester, yes, yeah, so I'm just outside London, but for the world, I normally just say London because I spend most of my time there, and it's just easier. And that's exactly why I say I'm from Madison, Wisconsin, when I'm just you know 15 miles outside of town in yeah. Sun Prairie. Mm -hmm. The only claim to fame for Sun Prairie is it's the birthplace of the artist Georgia O'Keeffe. So, oh, okay, yeah, and she she actually growing up said she was from Madison too. So, I mean, good company. <laughs> the same there. problem. Fair enough. Then, before we get started, totally, I just want to let you know I'm recording from the get go because cool. I believe in a 100 organic conversation. Mm -hmm. By all means, if you have something you want to promote, bring it up. I, I will ask you that question later on if there's something cool. you want to promote or where people can get a hold of you. Okay, but it's not about that. It's about doing That's what fine. you do so well. And that is add value because Thank you. I'll be honest with you, Richard, the reason I reached out to you, what, like a week and a half ago. Yeah. Is, not too long ago. Yeah. I, I reached out because I wanted something from you, but it was kind of a different something from you, which is, yes. do you have a high res photo of yourself? Because I'd love to include you in a presentation I was doing. Yes. And uh, I think I gave you a little bit of a clue what it was about. Yeah. Uh, it was a workshop called Creating Killer Content for Social Media. That's it. And yeah. the reason I chose you and I put you in a list of a whole bunch of other people that I, I was really very flattered, yes. Yeah. I, I look at these people as kind of top tier givers. And I'm not talking about the usual suspects, Gary Vaynerchuk or anything like cool. that. I, I'm, I'm talking about the people who are consistently bringing high quality content, real value, from within their skill set or their point yeah. of view. So yeah. it's important that the listeners understand what your point of view is. Can mm -hmm. you give us a quick um, uh, CV on what you've done, where you've been and what? Yeah, you've of course. Um, yeah. And, and you're right. I mean, it, it makes sense to not posture, but to draw from where you worked uh, the most. And sometimes we're not necessarily experts because it was in our DNA. It's just being on the pitch long enough. That's the thing. And so the, I'll give you the whistle stop tour. So if you go back about 17, 18 years, I was, I did, I've done two degrees both in history. And when I was finishing my master's, I wanted to stay on because I was in love with libraries and research. I wanted to do my PhD, wear a cardigan with holes in it and write long-winded papers and just generally be antisocial and write stuff, you know. So I wanted to be an academic, essentially. Like, it was a sliding doors moment. I didn't get funding for my PhD. So I, so I thought, I'll just get a job just for now. And I'll go back in a few months, you know, when I've made some funds and now I'm 38. Um, so, so uh, but what happened in between was that I, my, the first job I got, I actually had to finish my thesis early to start, which was a, a sales job. 
And weirdly, in 2002, 2003, this was a company that mostly focused on selling advertising in print, but had a new division that was selling web marketing. So back then, that's when I started the process. So my job was to cold call managing directors of companies selling equipment to the shipbuilding sector. Uh, you, so you can imagine like covered in oil and that. And I'm like, hi, there's this thing called the internet and I'm trying to sell them. So and I could just do it weirdly because I've always been a really a bit of a geek, but a bit shy, uh, quite the introvert. But on the phone, I seem to be able to get on with it. And I think it's because I just was being very direct about what it is we did and explaining it in the right way, you know. So since then, I've always sold in some way. I then managed teams, then I ran to other parts of the company and then was headhunted out. But after about eight or nine years, I then left the city because I was working silly hours. It wasn't like, oh, I had five pound in my pocket kind of story. It was more of a, it was going really well. I just had no time. I was you know, 60, 70 hour weeks and things like that. It's horrible. So I started my own thing, which actually was two taekwondo schools randomly because I was a black belt by that point. But simultaneously, I did some consulting offline, which just blossomed. And I was basically helping people with how to sell. And cut to today, I run essentially two businesses. One is consulting with big corporates on how to sell effectively, in it, but more how to market and engage with people in the right way. Uh, so that's kind of what I'm known for and the value you speak of is uh, very much centered around engagement and communication and sales. And the other side is my kind of a spun off into events. So Entrepreneur Business Live is monthly in London. And I'm thrilled that since January, we've done New York and we're literally about two weeks out from Toronto, another New York, Melbourne, Barcelona and San Francisco. So it's gone crazy this year. I'm very pleased with it. But that's me. So it's very much focused on the sales and engagement side. When you say it's focused on sales and engagement, I want to point out that it's not any kind of trademarked circle R system. I mean, you may have a name for it, but here in the United States, we love to package everything. And I'm one of those guys who puts a TM for trademark on everything. It's my way of cueing the audience that this is a bigger than garden variety idea. Absolutely. Yeah. Yeah. You know, and it's also some IP that I may want to own. So I'm going to put my flag down on it right away. Yeah. And I followed you for quite a while silently, like most okay. people on social media, specifically yeah. LinkedIn's kind of my number one channel. So that's where I ran into you. But I was interested to hear in one of your videos or one of your Q&A sessions that LinkedIn was kind of a thing you tried, I think, quote, on a lark, yeah. not all that long ago. Absolutely. Is that true? Absolutely right. Um, I, online quote unquote, I obviously I joined LinkedIn 10 years ago, like everyone else, but I cut my teeth with Facebook. Really, it was 2014 because I was doing online offline consulting. I thought I could just do this online. So I was armed with a Facebook account and a PayPal link. And that was it. And I engaged through direct messenger. I brought value. People were like, wow, that's really useful. And I said, so let's explore doing more. Facebook led to Instagram, which was fantastic, weirdly, for sales. And then uh, as in, you know, I'm, I'm not the type to go hard at someone by sales. What I mean is conversions from being a good guy, basically. But yeah, LinkedIn, I called it, I think, the about late 2017 that something was going crazy over there. And in March last year, so it's now been one year, I thought, well, let's go. I know I have to build communities. I've got a group of three and a half thousand on Facebook. Let's do this on LinkedIn. And it was crazy. Uh, Seriously, within a month, I was getting some really great inbounds. And I would now, even including social as a social platform, I would take LinkedIn over and above Facebook and Instagram. That's interesting. And that's totally based on your experience. It's funny about the same time period, I personally was coming out of working for other people situations and rolling out into my own. And I went to social media marketing world in February of 2018 and saw Guy Kawasaki. Wow. Okay. Yeah. And he's great. Anytime you can see Guy Kawasaki speak, he's surfing the lead edge of the wave of social media, of what technology, of everything from early days as one of the first Mac evangelists for Apple. Yes. True. He's still continuing that. And I went to see edges is known. Yeah. 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 And I went to see him speak and he said something that made me go, what? He said, he's always asked because again, he's kind of this seer that's looking over the edge and sees what's coming. 
he's always asked, what's the next big social media platform or play or whatever? And he said, well, it's already here. It's called LinkedIn. Mm. And, you know, for me, I joined in, uh, I want to say 2006 or something and used it as a resume in HTML, you know? Yeah. That's all yeah. it was. That's it. And, and then after I, and I started getting more and more involved even before I saw his talk. But after that, I'm like, my radar is open. My ears are up. My antenna yeah. are finely tuned to people who are doing it and doing it in a really fun, sharing, authentic way. And that's what I love about you, Richard. Sorry, I'm going to gush that's a little bit for you. You're one of those guys who definitely has things to sell definitely has engagements that you would like to drive people to do or convert to. Sure. But your technique, it's funny that you don't do jujitsu. You do Taekwondo because jujitsu is all about turning the power that someone's yeah. coming at you with and turning it back on them. You yeah. jujitsu people into engagement through being yeah. a decent guy, a huge sharer, and really just give, 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 give. Absolutely. And that, that's because it's the, the funny thing is you get to a point where it's like, I'm doing all right. And actually, I really feel that when you create what's called clout, so, you know, something of a, of a level of influence online, you can really use that to do interesting things. And all of the events I run have a component that donates to a local children's charity. So Pencils of Promise in New York, for instance, that event in January didn't generate thousands and thousands of dollars, but the amount it did generate has paid for a water filter for a year for a school in Ghana. And if you can create influence and the right way to do it is to just give a load, then it's almost bordering unethical to not leverage it in that kind of way. It makes sense to do that. And along the way, a little trick of income comes in brilliant stuff that's all good fun but i just think that you know these are the platforms where you can scale one man into blossom into so much more and, and the opportunities that come out of it are huge and was that same sounds very wistful at the same time i think it's really it's amazing what could happen and, and in, in one year i'm i'm kind of stunned by it all but i'm also uh you know at the same time i've worked my face off so it's uh it kind of i feel like i've got a lot out of it that i deserved this episode of the Nonfiction Brand Podcast is brought to you by Nonfiction Brandversity. It's a free Facebook group dedicated to the art and craft of personal branding. And we'd like to invite you. Just search Nonfiction Brandversity on Facebook and ask to join. You're in, guaranteed. I can't wait to see you on campus. Every once in a while, I like to get out the verbal highlighter just to highlight something that one of my guests has said. Did you hear that he started a year ago? One yeah. year, 365 days, and you've gone from LinkedIn agnostic to LinkedIn 100%. Even beyond that, you said yourself, LinkedIn is now, in your mind, a number one platform in spite of the fact that you have a huge presence on Facebook and Instagram. Yeah, Facebook. And Instagram's 30,000 followers as well, so it's not doing too shoddy. But, but the reality is that the best organic and meaningful traffic is on LinkedIn, Plus, if you do anything towards B2B, 80% of your leads are there anyway. But going back to your point about Guy Karasaki, what's interesting is that, isn't it crazy how we all just didn't really see it coming? And yet, you know, it's best part of 600 million members. It's like, how do we miss this? And I think what's, in, what's really interesting is that, in that is that we will never get this time again. Because of course, you know, if you go to this time last year, there were new, there's no new social platforms all the time. There's a new one recently that was being emailed at me, but there was Vero, for instance, last year. Right. Kind of right. Start, started, didn't happen. And that's all very well. And they come up with these great ideas. And of course, they're trying to get traction because their big issue is obscurity. This is the one unique situation with the complete opposite, where what you've got is you've got the sleeping giant of hundreds of millions of people. Basically, anyone you'll ever do business with is there. And the way I've likened it, it's like going to a stadium or a theater and the whole audience is there and there's a spotlight. And if you go and stand in it, because it's so silent relative to Facebook, you know, there's only a million pieces of content a day, which is nothing. And the thing you do on Facebook is it's like content. 
2.5 billion pieces of content a day. It's, it's insane. Um, and so the difference is huge because it's so quiet. We won't get this again, which is why it makes sense to go hard at it because, you know, I want to be in early. In the United States, we'll often term something like that a land rush based on the old yes. Oklahoma yep. land rush. Quite right. A lot of people are jumping into it now in a big way. But I actually want to back up a little bit because yeah. since we're talking about LinkedIn, I want to really recommend to you and anyone else, Wait What's podcast, Masters of Scale, with okay. the founder or co-founder of LinkedIn, Reed Hoffman. Wow. Okay. It's, it's excellent. And in fact, they just did a couple of episodes that were not Reed interviewing other people. Right. But his producer interviewing him because his story. Yeah. Mondo fascinating. But Absolutely. Yeah. Talk about a liberal arts oriented guy who yeah. just dove into tech in a huge way. And, you know, he was involved with PayPal and, and yes. LinkedIn. And now he's an investor with Greylock Investments. The dude is everywhere all the time. But it makes sense to follow him. Yeah. This is no coincidence. I've actually got Blitz scaling literally right here that arrived uh, in my house last week. So uh, I don't know if you read it. I'm, I'm excited about checking it out as well. He's always one worth watching because people like that just have their finger on the pulse, but not today's pulse, but the future pulse. So it's worth kind of checking out where they're, where they're acting. But he's part of that original PayPal mafia, isn't he? As yeah. Know. Well, exactly. I mean, you, you look at the people who came out of PayPal with Elon Musk, Peter Thiel, Reed Hoffman and others, and it's yeah. like a, a murderer's row is what we it's call insane. it based, it based on the old days of the, the pitching staff that could just take out anybody in baseball. Yeah, exactly. Uh, which is just crazy. But definitely check that out because LinkedIn, yes, people thought it was like a monster.com or a job yeah. site or something like that. Reed Hoffman was doing LinkedIn because he wanted to create the kind of connections we're talking about, mm. which is person to person, friend to friend, colleague to colleague, business to business associate. Yeah. And it, so it started out to become what it is just becoming now. Yeah. What? Uh, oh, I ten, totally agree. Years later. I and I think you'll see a periphery uh, of change in other platforms. I feel that Facebook will become more, it will become pure social because there's the B2C thing. But what businesses are trying to do is crowbar business in out of Facebook. And it's sure it's, it can be done on that. But when LinkedIn kind of, it's trying to mature a bit, but it's getting, it's not like you shouldn't use Facebook, but it's just like, it's the platform we kind of were after you know, yeah. uh, for a lot of the business work. And I think and it allows you to do a different type of play with Facebook, which is I migrate a lot of people over from LinkedIn to Facebook. And, and really that's, that's where you show yourself at play. Whereas it, sure you do with LinkedIn, but that is where people are seated and expecting a certain level of business tinge to what you're doing as well. But don't you think it will be interesting if you look at like the 18 months ahead, culturally speaking, there'll, uh, there'll be an interesting kind of meshing of worlds here because content creation, and I've seen this, can range from a mortgage broker speaking to a mortgage I know, a financial services person in some kind of an interview, which is cloud classes, very businessy, if you like, all the way through to those kind of, you know, those photos you get on Instagram where someone's holding a fake wad of cash and saying, send me some money and I'll, you know, I'll, I'll double your investment kind of scam things. I've seen one of those on LinkedIn. So there'll be the whole spectrum. And it'll be interesting because there'll be pushback, be a lot of pushback from people that, that you know, this content shouldn't be here kind of thing. Well, I, I think you're absolutely right. I was actually talking to someone. I don't know if you know her, Sarah Gross. Yes. Uh, oh, fantastic. I'm a bit of a fan of hers. Yeah, well, I am too. And I've had her on the podcast twice now because right. she's been such a valuable giver, especially when it comes to hacking LinkedIn for everything it's worth. And when I say hacking, I mean, she's literally getting down almost to the machine code to try to yeah. figure out how to make it work better. Yeah. I was talking to her about the difference between LinkedIn and Facebook and things like that and her take on it. And mm. again, I just want to set this up right by saying she's a 24-year-old whose only social media channel is LinkedIn. Yeah. And yeah. as I told her, I said, you're supposed to be on every shiny object known to man and uh -huh. you're on LinkedIn. And she said, yeah, I am because no one else my age is. So talk yeah. about the good old when everyone's zigging at zag. She's yeah. doing it in a big way. We were talking about what I call guru wannabes because there are a ton of guru wannabes on yeah. LinkedIn and yeah. they just grate my cheese. You know, I just. <laughs> but how are they manifesting? Because it's not Lamborghinis like Facebook three years ago. 
So, so how are you seeing them on, on, on LinkedIn? I see a lot of people telling you you can do, uh, well, it's kind of the Tim Ferriss four-hour work week thing, right. which he did, what, 15 years ago? Right. You know, or, or they're doing the, hey, this is me. I'm in uh, some exotic location, and I spent half an hour on my laptop, and I, uh, I can live the life I want. That's yes. a whole lot different than what I hear you doing. And that's why I don't put you in that guru wannabe category at all. Yeah, in I think fact, it's a dangerous word to use. I, indeed, expert as well. I, I, the closest I get to anything like that is I say I'm a specialist, which I think is fair. But I, yeah, you should never call yourself a guru either. Right? That's crazy, isn't it? I, I agree 100%. And I was listening to your Q&A today, which is every Monday, right? Let's get Every Monday. That. That's 137 weeks this week. So I've done a, we've done a lot. Wow, you have. So it's every Monday at what time? US? 1 p.m. local time is, I don't know about time zones because we're all having fun with daylight savings, but it's meant to be 8 a.m. Eastern time. Yeah, and I understand that you purposely chose that time period because you want to get into the U.S. market and you have a lot of audience in the U.S. Is that right? 70% across all platforms-ish, 70% of my audience is U.S. And entrepreneurs get up early, it seems. Um, So Entrepreneur Business Lives uh, are kind of aware of that but i'm I, you know i'm i i don't post in the morning because I, i'll grab i'll grab the uk in the afternoon and i want the us that that really loves my stuff by comparison to see it so it, it allows me to open up to a lot more people that way and yeah it's always just works good sweet spots uh 1 p.m for me because because you're getting people early and i'm seriously deeply i'm so touched every week because there is a body of people that show up every week you know you see them as they pop on like is that they're watching and you know the way i look at it is like that's amazing that on a monday morning so the first thing you do in the week you wake up and tune into my q a it's an amazing feeling and there are some people there who have watched like or have shown up since episode one over two and a half years ago so i'm i'm really flattered and and i feel i you know i would never not do it as, as it stands because there's clearly an appetite so i'm very very touched by it I can personally attest to the value of your Q&A thing. So check it out, Richard Moore. It happens on Facebook, correct? Yeah, and Instagram as well. And then there's a podcast and YouTube. It's my pillar content is the Q&A. Well, anyway, we're going to ask Richard in a second for where you can find him. Cause, well, yeah. the answer is just turn over a rock. You're going to find him because he's <laughs> everywhere, but he's everywhere in a good way. So to kind of loop this back to your question to me about What's the difference between a guru wannabe and someone who really offers value? The answer is you're saying a lot of the things the guru wannabes are saying it without the, what I would call false part of it. And that is, and it only takes a little bit of time. The answer is no, you've, you've got to work at it. It's got to be consistent. It has to have a tempo, all that stuff. The thing is that I I was talking about this on the Q and a earlier. I genuinely feel, and this isn't just because of my perspective, having kind of been immersed in this kind of marketing world, if you like, I feel that in the last three to four years, people, I can say people because we're all online are, have been conditioned by that kind of approach and we're used to it and you know it makes you roll your eyes like oh here we go here's another one of these ones and you know you try and watch a youtube video and then it's like oh look at me like you say i'm in hawaii and i've got this great idea and it saves you all, all this money and it makes you all this money and saves you all this time and i think the thing is that our awareness of it is so strong that that we're kind of like pushing back against it the reason why perhaps this is working is that I'm just being real. And I think what also happens, I, I do feel I'm in quite a sweet spot because, you know, whilst if you look at my team, there's plenty of people who are, say, 20 or so, and there's nothing, nothing wrong with being young. Reality is I have been on the pitch for 16 years, and that's not a 70-year-old, but that's someone who's done stuff, you know, and as a result, I can say, I remember this time when I did this. And I think being a practitioner both then and now adds weight to what I'm saying. And, and you know, you can read stuff in a book and I, there's plenty of people who are good at reading books and distilling that information with clarity and bringing value as a result. But you can't beat someone who's been in the trenches. And that doesn't mean it was hard all the time, but it means that I can 
whenever I go and speak with companies, and I, I did this recently, I work with Warwick Business School, helping their early stage startups uh, in their incubator. The first lecture in their curriculum, they asked me to come in and just give it real about what it's going to be actually like. And, and rather than giving them pictures of Lamborghinis and nice holidays, I can give them all the nice pictures and that, but actually what they really need is, here's what you do when it gets really tough, like in these moments. And here's, what, here's the common sense you'll need. And I think that hopefully that's fairly refreshing. That's exactly what a lot of people want. They, when people say authenticity, I, I have almost come to hate that word because it now means fake authenticity or it, something. Isn't that ironic? It really yeah. is. Right. Well, it's like any word that's overused. All of a sudden, it loses its meaning altogether. Yeah. But, um, on earth, for instance. Oh, yeah. Everyone's an on. Oh, you, you know what my favorite word to hate right now is? <laughs> founder. On. I just love talking to 22 year old founders. Well, there's similar. The other one that comes after the the forward slash after founder is CEO, and and that CEO maybe it's because I'm a bit older, but in my world, CEO suggests that there's a board, there's a bunch of people at that top table. It doesn't mean you're old, but it does mean that there's more than you. If you're the guy that makes the tea and does the sales and the finance and the marketing and everything else and runs it, and the heck, and you know what, you're the only guy in the company. And maybe CEO could be a ref- reform that word to something else, I think, because you're suggesting there's a big old board and, you know, 30,000 people in your company. Well, I agree with you. And the fact is, you were kind of talking about how people can suss things out. They can figure things out. They, yeah. they have a finely attuned eye, ear, and nose for yeah. BS. Yeah. Well, I, I tell you, anybody who's a 22-year-old founder, CEO, mm-hmm, sure you are. That's the thing. I mean, and the, and the reality, if you look at the psychology, and this is what I kind of, because I'm a geek in sales and marketing and engagement, it's important to understand the stuff. What's actually happening is always been the case is we're saying we're posturing as above our actual station in order to impress. It's as simple as that. So that's why, if, because I come from uh, several years back, about 18 months to two years, I, I worked at a recruitment business. So I was using LinkedIn a lot in like 2010. And it's interesting, no one ever writes junior in their profile, for instance. They're always senior consultants. It's like, you joined three minutes ago, but you're senior because it's posturing and, and trying to impress. That's all it is with the CEO thing. And if you remove, if you discount that someone's going to try, if you're going to try and impress people by saying you're the CEO, it's like, well, then what are you really using that for? That's why, like, I built Entrepreneur Business Live, but my job really should be like chief evangelist or something like that. But I just put head of growth because that's what I do. And maybe I'm being reductionist, but I think that's very 2019 because people would roll their eyes if I wrote chief commercial officer when well, that component is me and like three people. But maybe it doesn't matter too much. I don't know. But, but I, think, I think it does matter if you are targeting certain people. Those that are targeting those that will you know, fall for it, if you like, fine, go call yourself a CEO because that's the play you're using. I suppose the people I'm trying to target maybe would sense that that's posturing. I'm looking for a higher level of intelligence. I hope I don't offend too many. You see what I mean? That's oh, why I absolutely. Get, that's why I'm on this podcast. You wouldn't invite me on if I was standing next to someone else's Lamborghini pretending it's my own. Yeah, absolutely. And I just want to remind everybody that I'm talking with Richard Moore. I'm going to call you UK Richard Moore because M-O-O-R-E is a very common name, Richard as well. But it's Richard Moore from the UK and he happens to have reddish hair. So if you're looking for profile pics on Instagram, uh, LinkedIn, Facebook, you're going to see a smiling Richard Moore right there from the UK. Not looking like Prince Harry, though. Guy's got quite the beard at the moment. Oh, my gosh. You aren't kidding. Where can people follow you or, or what are your main kind of places to hang out online? Yeah, so do you know a really good place is the website to start? Because if you scroll to the bottom of the homepage, you've got the hub, which is all of the different places from SoundCloud through to LinkedIn. I would say I'm, I mean, I'm active everywhere because I have a, a content team now. But if you were to... Go to Facebook, I'm Richard Moore dot official after the forward slash or LinkedIn, Richard James Moore. LinkedIn's a really solid place to connect because that's where I'm interested in as everywhere, but I'm really interested in the community. If I do spend more time anywhere, it's probably there right now. Well, you just said something that got my salivary glands going, and that is content team because yeah. you started out as a solo. Now yeah. you've got some people with you, but... 
that's a tease to next week's episode. Richard and I are just going to stop for a second and start on to the second half of this conversation. But we are going to be talking next week about how we went from solopreneur to myself and others. And we're going to talk about his vision as well as to where he sees himself in five years, 10 years, and 50 years uh, at the top of the Richard Moore building downtown in the city of London. Love it. I'm, yep. So I am DP Knuton, and I'd like to remind everybody that you can join at any time the free Facebook group called Nonfiction Brandversity. It's absolutely free, and it's just for anybody who wants to get ideas and inspiration to build their personal brands or their small business brands from a whole bunch of really great people. Richard, do you have anything you'd like to invite people to? I would say, if I may slightly plug it, but this is hopefully useful for people, the Entrepreneur Business Group on Facebook, which is literally Facebook slash group slash Entrepreneur Business Group, is 3,500 people that I've been building for the past few years. And we stream the speakers from every one of the Entrepreneur Business Live events into there. So if you want to see amazing content creators from places like LinkedIn, so the likes of Mark Metry, who runs Humans 2.0, he'll be in New York in May, uh, Cher Jones, Katya Forsyth, uh, Belinda Aramida, they're running the Toronto to one in a couple of weeks' time. And even Melbourne, I'm mean, so thrilled that Tima Rahaj, um, Christina Murrell, and Diana Noygan uh, is go- are they all going to be speaking at these events that they in Melbourne and they'll um, they'll be streaming to that group. So it's completely free, but if you join it, first you've got an amazing ecosystem. We, you know, I do giveaways there all the time. So I, the last thing I gave away was a book. I often throw, you know, best comment gets fifty dollars kind of thing as well. So it's good. it's a really nice community there. But I hope it is some good value. You get everyone gets to uh, speak every so often and, and we do the live stream too. So I hope that's a good place for people to inhabit. Well, I haven't joined yet, but I'm going to join as soon as we're off the horn because uh, I I can't tell you how much I appreciate you being on the podcast. And that's it for this week. I'm DP Knutin, and he is Richard Moore. And I'll talk to you guys next time. Bye-bye. 